I mean lots of wilderness, not little patches and islands of wild areas in a sea of urbanism and industrialism, but just the opposite, bright little islands of civilization in a sea of unspoiled nature. That's the kind of future I am. Okay, enough of this whining and complaining and lamentation. Now to the business of the evening. Glen Canyon, now that you've all seen that lovely, impartial, strictly objective presentation. <laughs> Musical score by the devil. <laughs> and the chicken fat jug band. Sierra Club Schmaltz. I want to uh, say something about Glen Canyon myself. Many years ago, I wrote a little essay called The Damnation of a Canyon. Where did I put it? Which pretty well sums up my own view of the situation. I was one of the lucky few who did get to see the canyon before it was submerged, although I'm not sure I was lucky. It's a bittersweet memory. The damnation of a canyon. There was a time when, in my search for essences, I concluded that the canyonland country has no heart. I was wrong. The canyonlands did have a heart, a living heart, and that heart was Glen Canyon and the golden flowing Colorado River. In the summer of 1959, a friend and I made a float trip in little Japanese rubber rafts we bought at Walgreens down through the length of Glen Canyon, starting out at height and getting off the river near Gunsight Butte, and crossing the Fathers. In this voyage of about 150 miles in 10 days, our only motive power and all that we needed was the current of the river. Later, in the summer and fall of 1967, long after the dam was closed and the waters were rising, I worked as a seasonal park ranger at the new Glen Canyon National Wrecked Area. <laughs> During my five month tour of duty, I worked at the main marina and headquarters called Waweep at Bullfrog Basin and finally, at Lee's Ferry, downriver from Glen Canyon Dam. In a number of powerboat tours, I was privileged to see almost all of our nation's newest, biggest, and most impressive, quote, recreational facility, end quote. Having us seen Glen Canyon both before and after what we may fairly call its damnation, I feel that I'm in a position to evaluate the transformations caused by construction of the dam. I had the unique opportunity to observe firsthand some of the differences between the environment of a free river and a power plant reservoir. I should admit at the very beginning to a certain bias, indeed I am a butterfly chaser, a tree hugger, a googly-eyed bleeding heart, and a wild conservative. That's a quote from a Panguitch newspaper. <laughs> Googly-eyed, bleeding heart, I love that. <laughs> but despite, or maybe because of my googly eyes, I take a dim view of dams. I find it hard to learn to love cement. I am poorly impressed by concrete aggregates and statistics in the cubic tons. But in this weakness, I'm not alone, for I belong to that ever-growing number of Americans, probably a good majority by now, who have become aware that a fully industrialized, thoroughly urbanized, elegantly computerized social system is not suitable for human habitation. <laughs> Great.
great for machinery, yes, but not fit for people. Lake Powell, better known, better known as Lake Fowl, <laughs> formed by Glen Canyon Dam, is not a lake. It is a reservoir, as has already been said, with a constantly fluctuating water level, oh, more like a bathtub that is never completely drained than a true lake. As at Hoover Dam, the sole practical function of this impounded water is to drive the turbines that generate electricity. Recreational benefits were of secondary importance in the minds of those who built the dam. As a result, the volume of water in the reservoir is continually being increased or decreased according to the requirements of the Basin States Compact and the power grid system of which Glen Canyon is a component. The rising and falling water level entails various consequences. One of the most obvious, well known to all who have seen Lake Powell and Lake Mead, is the bathtub ring left on the canyon walls after each drawdown of water. Bays, coves, sloping hills, the many side canyons, where the original plant life has been drowned and new plant life cannot get a foothold. And of course, where there's little or no plant life, there is little or no animal life. The utter barrenness and barrenness of the reservoir shoreline recalls by contrast the aspect of things before the dam when Glen Canyon formed the course of the untamed Colorado River. Then we had a wild and flowing river lined by boulder-strewn shores, sandy beaches, thickets of cottonwood and willow, the thickets teamed with songbirds, vireos, warblers, mockingbirds, thrushes. On the open beaches were killdeer, sandpipers, herons, ibises, egrets. Living in grottos in the canyon wall were swallows, swifts, hawks, wrens, owls. Beaver were common, but not abundant. Not an evening would pass in drifting down the river that we didn't see beaver or at least hear the quack of their flat tails in the water. Above the river shores were the great recessed alcoves in the cliffs where water seeped from the sandstone, nourishing the semi-tropical hanging gardens of orchid, ivy, columbine, with their associated swarms of insects and birds. Up most of the side canyons before damnation, there were springs, sometimes flowing streams, waterfalls, and plunge pools, the kind of marvels you can now find only in such small-scale remnants of Glen Canyon as the Escalante area. In the rich flora of these lateral canyons, the larger mammals, mule deer, coyote, bobcat, ring-tailed cat, gray fox, kit fox, skunk, badger, and others found a home. When the river was dammed, almost all of these things were lost, crowded out. The difference between the present reservoir with its silent, sterile shores and debris-choked side canyons, and the original Glen Canyon is like the difference between death and life. Glen Canyon was alive, Lake Powell is a graveyard. For those who may think I exaggerate the contrast between the two, the former River Canyon and the present reservoir, I suggest a trip on Lake Powell, followed immediately by another boat trip on the river below the dam, the 12 miles of the original Glen Canyon that still exists. 